when you were neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem, worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. I understand uh, from uh, Pastor Elijah and also from heaven above that uh, you have been having visitations from the uh, angels that come from the pristine zone. And uh, there's something that God is doing in Canada as he established the areas uh, of the pristine zone, especially in this uh, time that we alter build together, that he is establishing the areas of the pristine zone in uh, Canada. And in, after this altar building, there are certain things and certain angels that will be released in the pristine zone. It also has a link to worship, and it speaks about worship that God has to, uh, has to do, uh, especially in this church. One of the things that the Lord said that He will be doing is that He will be sending more people to you who are called to worship, especially the area of 24-hour worship that God is preparing a team of people. And we pray that it will materialize, that it will come forth in, as soon as possible, because uh, 24 hour worship, worship must be one of those that will come and arise in order to bring a certain level of glory that comes. Uh, and uh, when I uh, was speaking to God about the area of uh, the future impartations, remember nothing is of ourselves. Nothing that we do is acceptable to God. It is only what is done through Christ in us that is acceptable to Him. And there is a level of worship that is coming that will require certain things, require a certain level. We have not reached that level of worship because this level of worship that the Lord talks about is that in the midst of the worship, transformation and transfiguration takes place. So that level of worship that God wants to bring, it can be in your personal life too. Who knows some of you might one day be called by God to worship the Lord and you draw into the presence of God. And as you draw into the presence of God <clears throat> and, and you begin to spend time with God and that's time and now in worship and that worship lasts longer and longer and you want to come out but you felt that you should stay longer and then you end up more and more in worship and then the time pass like the hours pass like minutes and the minutes pass like seconds and before long you didn't realize that you're spending so much time in worship and by the time you finish it might be many hours time or many days time and then you realize you've been in the presence of God for hours or maybe a day or two and then you come forth, transform, and change. This is that worship that he showed. As you all know, that uh, the Lord already showed that uh, before, the, before the rapture, there is a week of very, very special worship. That worship does not involve human beings alone. It involves angels, and it involves uh, visitations from heaven, and where men on earth combined with angels on earth, combined with the four living creatures. And in that worship, there is an instantaneous transformation to take place among especially those whose bodies are not fully transformed yet. And during that time, is that transformation process where death disappears from the body as you worship. And that transformation continues to uh, go forth and go from... Uh, glory to glory and grace to grace until by the time it's ready for the rapture, everyone has their new bodies. Everyone has their new bodies. And all ready for the trumpet call. Now I know in First Corinthians 15 it says when the trumpet sounds, then those who are alive, they in Christ will rise and those who are alive uh, in the twinkling eye they be transformed. But uh, even the one week of worship will be like a twinkling of an eye you would not even notice the one week passing by. Uh, and that's what the Lord showed in terms of uh, the worship that is coming forth. So I'm going to talk a little bit about this worship that is like the powers of the heaven and the age to come 
bringing forth to our time. And to talk about the qualities of this worship that is there, that perhaps will be in your personal life, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, at a time when you're worshipping in church, that you would contact the dimension. <clears throat> the first law of the worship is that it must not have human hands involved. Let me point to uh, the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, in the book of Exodus, when God spoke to them and was about to reveal His glory in Mount Sinai, which was the maximum that they began to receive, and as they gave the commandments and prepared for them to give the commandments, God told them about altar building and the altars that is possibly coming forth. In the book of Exodus chapter 20, <clears throat> that's where the Ten Commandments are given. <clears throat> and at the end of giving the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> God gave them the altar building instructions from verse 22 onwards. And God says there are two types of altars they can build. The first altar uh, is uh, made up of stones. The second one is made up of uh, <clears throat> just uh, whatever mound or earth that they can build. So it says in verse 24, An altar of earth you shall make for me. You shall sacrifice on it your burnt offering, and your peace offerings, your sheep and your oxen. In every place where I record my name, I will come to you, I will bless you. And if you make me an altar of stone. You shall not build it of hewn stone. For, this is the instruction, if you use your tool on it, if you use even one human effort on it, even chip the thing or touch it nice, in a human sense, touch it nicely, if you use one human effort on it, you already defile it cannot be accepted. So the stone has to be that which is done in nature, done by God's natural process, and not one human effort must be spent on it. The moment it's done upon it, it's not acceptable to God. That's what God instructs. And that's why when we go altar building, we look for natural stones. We have to reject stones that are cut or touched by human hands. And the Lord says, this is also the law of worship in the end time. That <clears throat> if the worship involves human effort, if the worship involves, of course humans are involved, but if it involves human effort, or if it involves human ingenuity, or human contribution, it is already default. I know that in the human world, we always uh, have music and we produce music. We are humans and that's what we love. But when it comes to God, if one atom of human effort is involved, it's rejected by God, not accepted by God. Even in a prophecy, in the book of Daniel chapter 2, if you look at Daniel chapter 2, in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, when he talk about the kingdom of God, which is in our time, in the days of the ten toes arising. He talked about the stone that represents Christ and Christ's kingdom. <clears throat> so Daniel had the same dream that God revealed it to him. In Daniel chapter 2, it tells us here, after the fourth kingdom, then there was uh, the ten toes in verse 42. And as the toes, chapter 2 verse 42, Daniel, and as the toes of the feet were partly of iron, partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile. As you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay, they will mingle with the seed of man, but they will not adhere to one another, just as iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, which is our time, the ten toes, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountains without hands. 
Notice the word without hands. It has to be done by God. So this stone, which we all know today, we are living stones. And the living stones are done without human hands. It has to be solely by the hand of God. Now you may ask, if it's truly by the hand of God, how then does it work? Since we humans in the corporate, we got all the time. How, how do we bring to God a worship that is initiated by God? Jesus used this phrase that I used in John chapter 3. What is born of the flesh is flesh. What is born of the spirit is spirit. There is no way that you could begin in the flesh and end up in the spirit. For a bad tree cannot produce good fruit. A good tree can produce good fruit. There's no way you can begin in the flesh and end up in the spirit. You will end up in more flesh. But here's the interesting thing. You can begin in the spirit and end up in the flesh. Because human effort comes in. An example of that is the Galatians. Paul rebuked the Galatians because he said, having begun in the spirit, do they want to go back to the flesh? Do they want to go back to human effort? Having begun in grace, do they now want to go back to the law? You read the whole book of Galatians, which is only chap- six chapters. And they began in the spirit, but they end up in the flesh. So here's the law of God. You cannot begin in the flesh and hope to end up in the spirit. But when you begin in the spirit, you might end up in the flesh because you begin to bring your own effort in. It began with God and you forgot that God was the one who did everything. When we all came to know Jesus Christ, you and I acknowledge that there's nothing we can do that can bring us close to God. If we could, then we would not have needed Jesus. We recognize that. We recognize that we need Jesus' presence in our life in order to change and transform our lives. But somewhere along the line, after we accepted Jesus Christ into our heart and have His presence in us, we began to say, alright, now we can start doing our own thing. Now we can start doing the good things that we think are good. Remember, that is also the flesh. And that's how the Galatians started the road, going into the flesh more and more in their worldly efforts and fleshly effort. Paul says that they have received the grace of God and uh, in vain he says, who has deceived you? Uh, and he says, having begun in the spirit, should they end up in the flesh? Can the flesh perfect that? We forgot that the whole of the Christian life is not about what you can do, but it's about what Jesus can do in you. And through you. It has never been about us. It has never been about our effort. It has been always about more and more of Jesus in us. So when Jesus come into our heart. The secret is not to begin to right now think about. Okay what can we do. The secret is how can we have more of him in our life. And that's why in the book of uh, Ephesians chapter 3, there's a little prayer here that uh, Paul continues, the very one who had a revelation about uh, what I call effortless Christianity. He says, after talking to them about the dispensation of grace, he introduced a concept of grace, and then he tells us here, in uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 3, verse 14 onwards, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He will grant you according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit. Please note that. Not your effort, but that His might will come into our life. His strength. Through His Spirit will come into us, He says. We'll be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man. We are only the receptacle. The secret of Christianity is not learning how to do things, but it's learning how to yield more to Jesus and let Jesus do it through us. 
And so learning to yield more to Him is inner man. It says that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the... The word comprehend is actually the word uh, katalambano, which means to receive. That we might receive with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's what He wants. He wants to increase in our lives so that more and more of Him dwells and as more and more of Him dwells in our life, He began to work out through us what He needs to do. And that is the essence of Christianity. That you and I will do nothing. Say, we will do nothing. Except when Christ energizes in us. See, as long as Christ does not stir, we do not do. We have to acknowledge that we can do nothing of ourselves. Again, I repeat, Jesus says in John 15 verse 5, Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. And he talks about us as a plant, as a branch in the vine. When we are connected, the branch does not have its own energy. The branch will die if the branch is separated from the tree. The branch has to only do one thing. To learn to let the energy that is in the roots and in the main stem supply the nutrition and keep receiving it and as we receive it we automatically begin to grow the connection is the important thing disconnected with God we actually are profane disconnected with God we cannot do anything which is pleasing to God and God said that in the pristine section and the type of worship he wants to bring forth has never ever been brought forth on the planet earth. You know why? It is a worship that involves the Holy of Holies, which even in the Old Testament, they can only see a glimpse of once a year. In the book of Leviticus, if you read with me the book of Leviticus, and uh, you look at chapter 17 and then 18. Talks about the blood. Afterward, we look at uh, uh, Numbers 2. And... uh, Oh, I took Leviticus. Numbers, sorry. Numbers. The book of Numbers. Numbers. Okay. In the book of Numbers, it tells us here, and let's get you the right place. In the book of Numbers, <clears throat> and the place that we're going to start reading from, let's look at, uh, okay, let's start with Numbers chapter 17. Numbers chapter 17. After what we go 19, but 17 first, we talk about the presence of God. That he has. Because it's something that God wants to do today. Also in your lives. In number chapter 17. When they were wondering. Which one of them that God would use. God says bring 12 rods. In verse 1. Get from them a rod from each father's house. All their leaders according to the father's house. 12 rods. Write each man's name on his rod. And you shall write Aaron's name on the rod of Levi. For there shall be one rod for the head of each father's house. Place them in the tabernacle of meeting before the testimony where I meet with you. And it shall be that the rod of the man whom I chose will blossom, 
Thus will I read myself the complaints of the children of Israel which they make against you. So they place it and then overnight it says in verse 8, it came to pass on the next day, just being in the presence of God. Being in the presence of God, it says, Behold, the rod of Aaron and the house of Levi has sprouted and put forth buds, have produced blossoms, yielded ripe almonds, and that's just because it is in the presence of the Lord. Overnight, an impossible thing happened. That dead stick took on life, grew leaves, grew branches, bore flowers, bore fruit, the fruit produced, and it's alive when they took it. Now that little branch was taken and placed in the Ark of the Covenant. And it continues to be alive today in the Ark of the Covenant. Except that today's Ark of the Covenant is hidden. It will be revealed again after the rapture. In the Ark of the Covenant is the manna, a bowl of manna, this rod, and also the tablet of the Ten Commandments. The Ark of the Covenant is the only piece of furniture that will also be raptured. Because there is a certain presence today. Jeremiah hid the Ark of the Covenant somewhere uh, in, in a hidden place in the mountains, in a cave. Uh, it will be unveiled again. But in the Ark of the Covenant is so much life of the presence of God that nothing can decay. In the same way, in the end time, this worship that God wants to bring, whenever anyone can enter into this presence, no sickness can be in the presence of this level of worship that I'm talking about. The worship that God wants to bring when it's initiated by God. In that presence, all sicknesses are healed. Even in the time of the Bible, in Jesus' time, it says, and the sick were all healed. They use the word A-L-L. Only one time in the New Testament, among humans, did he use the word, they were all healed. That is in the book of Acts, in Acts 5, when Peter's shadow was healing, and everyone who was there were all healed. Because there was a special presence that was not initiated by man. Now before we go to the New Testament, let me look at Acts, uh, uh, Numbers chapter 19. In Numbers chapter 19, we have the high priest once a year, he will go into the presence of the Lord. And it tells us <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> of the high priest. And at that time, uh, of course, uh, he's uh, training uh, Eliezer. And let me highlight this. Okay. Okay, in this place, chapter 16 of Leviticus, sorry. 16 of Leviticus. says here in verse 11 and 12, let's look at 12. When he comes near to the Holy of Holies, he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine, bring it inside the veil, and he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, then the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull, sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side, before the mercy seat. He shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. So, that's the only time once a year when he enters into the presence of God. And into that presence, he would have to do all his ceremonies, sprinkle seven times. And these seven times that he sprinkled has always been a mystery. Why seven times? It was pointing to the time when in the book of uh, 
Revelation chapter 2 and 3, when God speaks to the seven churches, and the seven churches were given seven promises to the overcomers. And the promise of the overcomer was from the time of Ephesus, when you partake of the tree of life, all the way to the church of Laodicea in chapter 3, where you're actually in the presence of God. And it talked about the sevenfold dimension of God's presence. Every single one of the church of Revelations talks about an aspect of what is done in the presence of God. They all had linked to something to do with the presence of God that this worship will bring. That if you enter into this worship, which is now available only in Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, the veil was open. When the veil was open, there is a level of worship that is open to us. That is initiated by God. Initiated by Christ. It is like the nutrition of Christ flowing into us. And anyone who gets into this worship, I did ask a lot, Lord, in 2,000 years of Christianity, have any of God's people touched on this realm of worship? He says, a glimpse. A glimpse. One of those, uh, of course, it's very hard to place it in church history because then it's subject to uh, criticism whether this is true, this is not true, and you need uh, witnesses to say that actually happened. Although the Lord says it has, people have a glimpse. Let's look at the Bible. In Acts 16, he says, they touch on that. In Acts 16, they touch on that. In Acts 5, they also touch on that. So let's look at some incidents so that we can understand a little bit where they contacted this dimension of worship. So let's look at uh, Acts 16 first. Paul, in Acts 16. And we know that he was uh, beaten up for casting demons out. And he was in prison. He went there and he was sent by God to preach there. He says in verse 25, But at midnight, See, this is their worship. There were no musical instruments. All they had was their voices. And at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and they were singing hymns. As they were singing hymns to God, the prisoners were listening to them. There were no music. All they were doing was recalling hymns and they were singing hymn after hymn while their body was in pain. They contacted a level of presence and they touched, just touched a little bit on their presence and it caused an earthquake. That doesn't mean that you and I purposely caused an earthquake kind of thing when we worship the Lord. But it was something significant that the Lord wanted to show and the Lord knew that it was going to be recorded. And He needed something to show us in the end time what this worship will do. What this, now, note the word, they were singing hymns. They only touched a little bit on that. Not even in the fullness. And not only was there an earthquake, it says, the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately, all the doors were open. Now, that is supernatural. You know, usually in an earthquake, the doors tend to be closed. And in fact, the walls will come down and make things even more harder to escape. But this was no ordinary earthquake. It didn't come from the ground. It was from their singing. Normally in an earthquake, they will what, have an analysis and geologists and seismologists will examine and say, we will trace where the center of the earthquake is, correct? So they have a way to trace where it all began by looking at the side effect, where the earthquake was radiating from ground zero. But in this place, 
it was radiating from the prison cell of Paul and Silas. That was a center of where the energy was, was coming out like a bubble. And it's from there that everything radiated and the earth shook and all the prison doors opened. There was something that shook until every prison door was open. And not only that, the chains that were around them. You know how hard those chains are? It's not easy to remove. You actually need a blacksmith to remove the chain around your hands or around your ankle. But that earthquake caused a resonance and shook everything until all the chains sort of fell away. They, and and I, I saw in visions that it actually broke. Now, we might not have seen that. You have seen a glimpse of sound energy. The sound energy, when it's harnessed, can actually cause uh, glass to break. And in the time of uh, the Old Testament, when they shouted with one shout, uh, after walking seven, ra- seven rounds on the seventh day in Jericho, the walls fell down. Because that was not just the sound energy, it was the energy of God. But here we have is a touch of the power of the worship that is there. And just as the iron can sort of be broken in pieces, the diseases, sickness, viruses, cancers, or anything that infect the human body will also die and drop away. When you enter into this worship in your life. Like I say, this worship can involve music, can involve things without music, can involve only your voice, but if you touch on this, even for a few seconds, you're perfectly healed. No sickness can cling to you. No only are you healed. Every single cell in your body that is dying, aging, getting too old, gets renewed. This is from this energy of worship that the Lord talked about, that He wants to release. And I say that Acts 5 was a glimpse of that. So let's look at Acts 5. In Acts chapter 5. I want to paint a picture of the possibility of it. Acts 5, after Ananias and Sapphira died, they began to all fear the Lord. Uh, Acts 5. It says, after Ananias and Sapphira died, verse 11, Great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. And through the hands of the apostles in verse 12, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Now, where is the word for worship? The word one accord. If you say, where were they singing? They were singing with one accord. They were praying with one accord. If you remember, the word one accord applies to their prayer and spending time together. And there they were in the temple with one accord. It didn't record that they were singing. It didn't record that they were worshipping. But how in the world did they get one accord? So they were doing something one together. And the oneness that they were doing together was through the area of worship that they were doing. Believers were increasingly added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who are tormented by unclean spirits. And this is the one time in the Bible it mentioned, exactly like Jesus. They were all healed. In other words, no sickness, no disease can stand against this presence. And it was not the presence of Peter's shadow. It was something behind the shadow that was there. And uh, also the Lord showed to me that there was a certain glory there that was also casting the shadow. Uh, Not just the sunlight. Because if if you need 
to heal by shadow, you need the sun to be shining. Tell you it's a very hot day to walk in the sun, the shadow. And you got so many people healed. Uh, but there was also a shadow cast by the presence of God. People felt something. And notice, no one lay hands. No one say even a prayer. In fact, if there were any noise, the only noise was either Peter walking noisily, which I don't think so, or the noise of the people maybe worshipping God or praying while they're waiting for their turn. But there was not even a prayer made. No prayers. It was just as a shadow passing by. They received the healing. That is the highest point in the book of Acts. The Lord says, that was a glimpse of this worship. Now, if this was a glimpse, in our time, it will be in fullness. We have not yet seen what the fullness is like. The fullness will be rapture. We will reach a fullness of that. But we will have glimpses of that and touches, not just glimpse, a touch of those things throughout this revival. Your question now is, what are the keys behind this? They are found in Revelation chapter 2 and 3. Chapter 2 and 3. Which I will look at now from the worship point of view. The worship point of view. You didn't know there are seven points of worship. Remember the priest had to sprinkle seven times? The Lord says, you can teach this seven times in many areas. Many areas, many areas. Seven this, seven that, seven this, seven that. But the most important is the seven things. Because why must the priest do seven times in the Holy of Holies? So it has to do with something that has to be done in the very presence of the Holy of Holies. Seven times. And it speaks about the seven spirits of God. Which is from Ephesians to Laodicea. The spirit of mercy. And so let's look at the book of Revelation, chapter 2 and 3. And we have looked at it from the point of the overcomer. We need to look at it from the point of worship. In the point of worship, it says in verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. To him who all comes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now, before that, God also told them in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, the beginning, just, just the beginning of this worship is that it must be first love. The moment your love becomes second, third, fourth, you really drop off. It becomes human worship. Of course, humans do worship God too. And your worship will be no different from the Old Testament people worshiping God, which is pretty good anyway. But if you want this worship at the most holy place, you don't want just a worship in the outer court. You don't want to worship even in the holy place which the priests in the Old Testament worship God. Which is already pretty good. All the good things you see in the Old Testament are worshipped outside the Holy of Holies. Because no one could enter into the Holy of Holies except the high priest. So the beginning of this worship, you notice it has to do with the heart. That at the time when you worship God, your heart is so in love with first love so that it's as if no other human being, no other thing on earth, no other pleasures on earth, no other spiritual, natural, or things that you desire could capture you except the first love of God Himself. And of course, all of you probably say, Hey, Amen, brother. Amen, pastor. I got first love. Let me tell you, that maintaining first love is so much energy that you have to be fully given to that first love. Now, let me tell you, it will draw into the background and in the background you have first love, but you're occupied with different things in life. The first love that God requires when you're worshipping is that it takes all of your first love in your spirit all of your first love in your soul, 
all of your first love in your natural body so that you got nothing else. Spirit, soul, and body. Now, you might have first love in your spirit while you go about doing different things in this life. Because your soul could be doing something else. Your body is doing different things. So at that moment, the concentration of first love is not there. So only your heart worships, which is pretty good. But when you enter into that presence, that first love must be in your spirit, in your soul, in your body, so that you do not care about one single thing on the planet or the universe except loving God. So that is only the beginning of this worship. That, that full concentration with first love. If you could just even sit one hour, okay, let's one hour, one hour might be a bit concentration for some of you. If you could only sit 10 minutes with full concentration of first love in God into this worship, something changes in you. No one, the Lord says, no one comes out from this presence without being touched or changed. I want to give a glimpse of how Jesus concentrated. In translating, oh, uh, we come back to Revelations. Let us look, look at Luke chapter 22. In translating Luke chapter 22 from the Greek, there was a certain phrase that I translated differently. And uh, that was when he was praying in the garden at Gethsemane. I still remember the translation. And uh, chapter 22, Jesus in the garden. And it says, let me take a particular... Okay, verse 44. And this is a phrase, verse 44. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Then his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And uh, we will do it when I go back uh, on the Thursday, uh, uh, which is a, the, the, where we... we we continue the next part of this teaching on the Thursday Bible study in Singapore. But the word agony or agony came from the Greek word agonia. Agonia is not the word agony directly translated. It involves more than agony. Because the Greek word is from the word agon. Agon is not speaking about sadness or distress, the word agony in our English. Agon is the word fight. Fight. So Paul says, I have fought a good fight. He used the word agon. I've agon a good, uh, I have agonio a good agon. I have fought a good fight. So the word agonia is actually the word for conflict inside. There's a conflict going on inside Jesus. And so the agony was caused by the internal conflict that was going on. That he was battling for us. Because remember, he has to become sin for us. And so there was this tremendous conflict on his inside. He involved his spirit, soul and body. Then the next phrase is the word he prayed more earnestly. Uh, the word pray is the normal Greek word prosukomai. But the word more earnestly is the word used only one time in the whole New Testament. This is the one and only time it's used. It's a long word. It's the word actenesteron. And that Greek word, uh, uh, oh, that's not bad. Eh? It's like, bring out the Greek. No, no, no Greek there. Okay. Actenesteron. And that word is used only one time. Only one time in the whole New Testament. And I look at that translation, and uh, in that translation, it actually involves um, the word uh, uh, a concentration, a stretching out, uh, like the hand stretching out, something focused very clearly. And remember, we used to use the word one breath. Uh, when you do something, you do it one breath. It came from Elijah when we met him. He said, when you do something, do it one breath. This is a word that conveys a one breath. That means, like Jesus, when he was praying, 
he gave himself and he do this full concentration. There was a conflict in this full concentration. It was like even every breath with one breath, he don't want to let it go. It's almost like when you're doing something and you've got a lot of distractions coming and uh, maybe lunch is ready, this is ready, and you say, no, no, I, I want to finish this one because if I stop doing this, I could start all over again. It's like a plane about to take off. When the plane is about to take off, the plane starts taking speed. And you can hear the noise of the engine uh, revolving. And as the engine revolves, the plane takes full speed. Then it begins, the whole plane begins to vibrate. I mean, if it's a good plane, don't vibrate so much. I don't want the plane to vibrate so much. You know? and, uh, so, but the plane begins to vibrate a little bit. You could feel the intensity. That the whole energy of the plane was now concentrated on taking off. And the plane goes... And then it takes off. And this is like what it's like, that one breath, that full concentration, that if Jesus, uh, if you let go, you've got to start the plane all over again. You've got to go back to the place to take off. So it's just like Jesus with one breath, and he wanted to pray right through. His concentration was so great. It is not necessary blood that came out. But it say that, uh, you know, people sweat all the time. But very rarely do people sweat like the blood pouring out. You know, if someone is cut, the blood pours out. Especially if you hit an artery, the blood is pouring out. So when Jesus was concentrating on that, there was so much energy that the sweat was pouring out like water. I don't know why anyone here concentrated under like that before. But that was so much concentration. The body's muscles and effort was so concentrated. It was literally like running a marathon. I could imagine Jesus, you know, if you, could, if you could go near him at that time, you could have felt every muscular contoction that was going on. So much concentrated, the muscles were vibrating so much that the sweat was being produced by the energy. That is one breath. Okay, that is like the first love when you're worshipping Him. That means when you're worshipping, you're concentrating to give all your love to Him. Then you begin to touch one-seventh of this worship. One-seventh. Now, some of you are going to, might use too much of your human effort, you know, so your human effort... No, you know, you don't have to contort until like you're about to go to the toilet. You know? That will be your own effort. It has to be an energizing that comes from the Lord. Something energized on your inside. That, that love that comes, that pure love that comes. There's a type of peace involved. And, but the thing is that at that point, you're so concentrated. If we have dropped a noisy thing around you, you will not even have heard it. That's how good that concentration is. That's Revelation chapter 1. That level of worship. So let's go back to Revelation chapter 2. And the church of Smyrna. In verse 11. He says. He talks about tribulation. He says. He who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. And I ask a lot, Lord, how does this link to the worship? The Lord says, it links to the verse before where He says, Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. You shall be tested. You will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful to death and I will give you the crown of life. The Lord says that in number two, you reach the, the place where you are not even aware of any suffering in your body. You're not even aware of any fears in your life. At that point, you're not afraid of anything. You're not afraid even of. Um, you're not even afraid of um, uh, embarrassing yourself, kind of thing. It's just like sometimes when you're in a meeting, and the Lord might just come to you and say, "Kneel down," and then nobody is kneeling. And then you feel that you're the one who kneel down is so embarrassing in the presence of everybody else. And, but then if you love the Lord and you really think you heard the voice, you still kneel down. 
And then when you kneel down, something takes place. You feel some presence of the Lord come upon you. Same way. Like sometimes when you're deep in concentrating in this worship, and uh, you might feel some discomfort in your body here and there, but all the discomfort disappear, all the sufferings disappear, all the fears in your life disappear. That means that at this point, is, you know, what is someone not afraid of dying? Someone not afraid of dying is someone not afraid of what will happen in this life. You, someone who do not worry anymore. Someone who do not worry about the things of this life. That means someone who is totally free from this time. At that point in your life, you're not even thinking about the natural things. Worrying is far from you. Fear is far from you. So you enter into this place where you are just absolutely in the Spirit. Only the Spirit matters at that point. And you are not aware of the discomfort in your life anymore. Um, in terms of worship, I will describe it uh, in a different way. Uh, I remember uh, once in a while, we don't do that often, when, um, uh, when we have uh, worship time, um, in, uh, sometimes we have special days of worship. Like we say, okay, we've got three days special prayer. We fast and pray. We come together for worship. And on some days, it's worship in tongues. And I remember uh, during those times, we don't have the choir. So I'm the one end up playing the piano. And so sometimes we do it all night and all that, uh, once in a while. But when you're playing the piano for hours, your hands do feel pain. Your hands do get tired, especially if you're doing it three days in a row. And so, I remember that uh, uh, in the natural, you still can feel, you still can feel some discomfort, but because you're caught in the midst of this worship, you're saying, God, you energize my hands right now. Because I want to complete that one hour, two hours, three hours. I don't want to let go that one breath. And so, in spite of your physical discomfort, you say, you know, now let the spirit move the hands. Because your own energy is not enough. And your hands do feel. And sometimes at the end of that, you know, the fingernails get broken. I got many broken fingernails before when you play very long. And uh, then uh, because I, I strum it also once in a while with the fingers. And then the fingers get strained. And, uh, but you expect the resurrection power of the Lord to renew that. And so then you make a determination you're not going to stop because of your body. If your body fail you, you still press on. So at the moment when Jesus was in Gethsemane, he could feel his body, his reach is limit. But he pushed himself in. So, like, how long can you worship in a kneeling position? How long can you worship in a sitting position? Right? Not long. You know, you've been kneeling for hours and hours, or you're playing the guitar for one, two hours, especially when you're 24-hour worship. And 24-hour worship, we had that, and we got teams of uh, musicians doing four-hour shift. So they do four-hour shift. But imagine, I remember, you know, if you are pressing the guitar for four hours with the chords, your hands do get tired. But then you remember, this is not natural anymore. You ask for supernatural strength, and you expect supernatural strength to come. So you say, wow, musicians have to worship like that. Hey, you got it easier. Last time, when under David's time, they had to fight with supernatural strength. And some of them fight, some of David's mighty men, they fight until their hand and the sword became one. And it's tiring to hold a sword for a long time. But they fought and fought until they're so tired, they had to say, Lord, renew my strength. And they continue fighting and because, you know, one of the mighty men, they fought until the hand and the sword became one. And because of him, the whole battle was turned around. So today, we apply that to musicians. Because there is a physical limitation to your body. So your body reaches limit. Or some of you are not musicians and you don't understand. Your voice. You've been singing for the past four hours. So you've been praying in tongues for four or five hours. And then you've got to continue. You want to press on. Something has come. The presence of God has come and something more to come. Your voice is reached its limit. And you say, Lord, I don't want to let go now. 
If I let go now, it's just like a plane about to take off and I have to start all over again. And you say, Lord, give me strength. Your grace is sufficient for me. Remember when Paul says he got no more strength and he got no more energy and you say, Lord, take this away and God says, my grace is sufficient for you. Second Corinthians 12. So then the grace of God comes, you suddenly have what I call the second wind. Second level of energy that comes. And this time, you are really weak and you're depending on His strength. And you know you've got no more energy left. And you know that you literally just live physically by His presence. You will only know that when you reach the limit of your strength. Limit of your strength in playing, limit of your strength in energy, limit of your strength in staying awake. And then you say, Lord, I really don't want to let this go. And you press on. Now that is the second level where you enter into the place of worship that is pure gift of God's strength. Something in you energizing. And for some reasons, God sometimes let you run out of strength before you let the second wind come. So that you reach a point where it's 100% energy can come from God. Remember I told about no human energy can come. So at that point, even all your human energy is finished. And then you really want to, want to stop in the natural. But you say, if I stop now, I cannot press it. It's too, too much. And you say, Lord, give me that strength. And like Jesus, God sent an angel, strengthen you, shoom. Of course, we hope that your sweat don't drop like blood and all the instruments all get wet. But that is the second of the law of this worship. And, and God has His ways of emptying you of your strength. And you just have to rely on the Lord. Then you will feel something else. Something energizing you. This number two of this worship. Number three, the Gamos. Says in verse 17, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I give him a white stone and under stone, a new name written which no one knows, except him who receives it. See the word no one knows? The Old Testament has this, a new song to the Lord. We have always sing songs that other people compose. We have always sing songs and tunes that have been given. But in this area of worship, you actually enter into a place where your own tunes and your own songs come. And you might have no words, so you might be singing in tongues. And you will enter this place where it's actually your melody created by God. It is, if we can illustrate, God is a musician playing with your DNA making music. So it is your own unique frequency coming up. It's your DNA being made musical. Do you know that in heaven, all of us radiate a music? On this earth, as we yield to God, there is a music and resonance that comes forth for our, our life. And what God does is, in this third area, this new thing that He does, is where Jesus in you is using your DNA as an instrument and producing sounds, voices, melodies, through your voice box, or if you're a musician, giving you new tunes and keys to play. And if you're singing in tongues, giving you a new tongue, a new language, a newness that comes that is unique to only you and you alone. Then you touch the third level of this worship. Then the fourth level, I just give, give it quickly. In this worship, it says... In verse 28, I will give him the morning star. Besides the authority that already starts operating in your life, by this fourth level, there's a level of authority in your worship that the devil begins to be broken. 
In, in this fourth level, it is like all the authority of the devil begin to be broken. Now, in the book of Acts chapter 5, they touch on that. That is why in the presence of their one accord, and the people, I saw the people lying up. As they line up, they were worshipping God. And as they were worshipping God, and Peter was also worshipping God. So as everyone worshipped God, as the shadow passed by, all of Satan's sickness, disease and ailments were crushed to powder. And no sickness could stand against that. But on top of that is what I call the morning star. The morning star has a title that is used of angels before and of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the day star. But at the fourth level, your worship takes on an angelic quality. Where angels merge with you. Worship angels merge with you. And you could sometimes hear the melodies of heaven. In one of the songs, uh, Blow upon me, O wind of God. Let me hear the melodies of heaven. Where you literally are hearing the melodies of heaven. And the melodies of heaven are flowing through you. And at that stage, it's like you're no more on earth. Angels, you could be alone in a room, but most likely your room is filled with angels worshipping with you. If you have open vision, you will realize it's a very crowded worship. And that's where angels join with you in oneness. And that's a level of heavenly presence. And number five. Says here, and uh, verse uh, five and six. He who all comes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let me hear what the Spirit says to churches. Now, your name before the angels is wonderful. Jesus talked about you to the angels. Angels know you by name. But he says, Jesus will talk about you to the Father. By this fifth level, you are actually in the audience of the Father. You know what it's like. In the natural, sometimes they got ceremonies and all that. And uh, human ceremonies, important occasions, like the Olympic or like, uh, uh, government ceremony. They will have, and then they might have singers. And the singers, they choose usually the top musicians from town. Top musicians in the country to perform. Uh, in order, they must be super, super good to perform at the Olympics or to perform at, uh, at a special event where there could be millions online. Not everybody gets an audience of the Father. But by the fifth level, your song is the centerpiece to the Father. It is like all heaven is now singing that one song before the Father. At that stage, it actually involved the four living creatures and the 24 elders. So, not only merging with the angels, but merging with the four living creatures. And you'll find in this place here, in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, just, uh, oh, the next chapter, just quickly go forward. It says here, the four living creatures, in verse 8, chapter 4, verse 8, they do not rest day and night. They always say, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Then the 24 elders fall before him in verse 10, sits, who sits on the throne and worship him. And it says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, power, for you, are, you created all things by your will that exists and were created. So the, the 24 elders and the four living creatures are always worshiping, correct? Imagine joining with them in worship. And there's a point in uh, chapter 5, after the Lamb of God opened the seal, the four living creatures, and all the living creatures, look at verse 11, then I look, I heard the voice in chapter 5, verse 11, of many angels around the throne, the living creatures, the elders, a number of them, were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, and strength honor and glory and blessing. And uh, so they all began to worship Him together with one word. Now imagine, when all the four living creatures and all the 24 others were worshipping God, 
You think anybody want to sing a different song at that time? No, there was only one song. All heaven is singing that one song. So by the time you reach this fifth level, where you got the attention of the Father, it is like at that moment, you might say, wow, how can heaven got so much time and importance? Because heaven is an eternity. Time is created by God. And God can create pockets of time where your worship comes before God and is the centerpiece that is going because it was not human. It came from the Spirit and finally God could find a human that can merge with angels, 24 elders, four living creatures. And you know, many people talk about merging today, but they forgot what the merging is for. Because we human think in terms of needs. When we come to church, we want our needs to be met. And we always think about our needs. We forgot that the merging is not for needs alone. Needs will be met. But the merging is to produce a quality of worship equal and greater than the four living creatures and 24 elders by themselves. Imagine that. Because now you've got humans, angels, 20, living, four living creatures and 24 elders. He's waiting for you and I to worship, merge together. And at that level, he has a center attention of the Father. And it's like the whole universe is singing the same song. Imagine, you could be singing in tongues, and as you're singing in tongues, imagine all of the four living creatures and the 24 others also singing the same. That is a privilege. And you're before the throne of the Father, doing just that in itself. Sixth area, as we look at chapter 3, in the church of Philadelphia. Notice it says in verse 7, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. I always wonder why David is used. Tabernacle of David is mentioned in Acts 15, where they say the tabernacle of David will be restored. And people always tie David to the establishment of the kingdom of Israel. They always think in terms of a kingdom. That's why Jesus was called son of David. Because he came to restore a kingdom. David was a king. But Jesus is the king of kings. Do you know that Jesus already has fulfilled the prophecy of David having a kingdom? He is the final son of David. To whom the covenant is given to David that he will always have a son on the throne. So Jesus became that son. So he has fulfilled the prophecy of David's covenant that he will have a kingdom and he reigns. The only part of David's covenant that is not fulfilled, David was the one who established 24-hour worship. And that 24-hour worship will involve us. That is a part of David's covenant that is not fulfilled. So that is why it's tied to the key of David. Why do you think called the key of David? Why not key of Elijah? Why not key of Moses? Why not, you know, key of uh, Jesus himself? Why not call by any other man of God? Why call by David? What did David do that was so special, that was different from anybody else? If you say he was a king, his kingdom will really fulfill in Jesus. Our kingship, our kingdom we receive is based on Jesus. Jesus reigns, and Jesus reigns through us. But there's one part not fulfilled. We are the 24-hour worshippers. We are the bride. We are the worshippers of God. And when we find our place to be 24-hour worshippers, then we have entered the sixth dimension. That is why that last week before the rapture, we are so used to 24-hour worship. In fact, not only the last week, in this revival, there are many, many times where people worship more than 24 hours. Personal and corporate. 
I wonder when will be the first time. You know, many of us got 24-hour prayer. Have anyone tried personal 24-hour prayer? It's very powerful. Where you stay all night by yourself. You pray for morning. Let's say you start when we wake up 7 a.m. And you spend the whole day in prayer, including the whole night. It is powerful. If none of you have sought God like that before, you have missed something. You have missed something. You need to find time to seek God. But even more powerful is 24-hour worship. You don't have to wait till publicly somebody do that. One fine day, you're so hungry for God. Then you say, I'm going to take off for one full day of worship. Full day, two, four hours. So, the moment you wake up, of course you brush your teeth, whatever you need to do, then you start worshipping from the morning, non-stop, until the night. Then you worship through the night. Then you worship until the next morning when the sun rises. Then you complete exactly 24-hour worship. Uh, I already sense no one here has done that before. Okay, those online, nah, you haven't done that. So, God will have told me. Uh, but, there will be people who do it in this revival. As a revival progress, there will be a place and time when someone does it. And, uh, so, when you do it, uh, who knows, we might actually do Try one day in Singapore. How about that? You know, on the holidays. Thank you for those amens. <laughs> <laughs> so, whatever. And that first, just worshipping, and you're singing in tongues, singing in tongues. Now, you get, need to drink in between, of course. You know, but 24 hours, I don't mean that you don't drink. Or you might go to the toilet in between. So, those few seconds are what I call injury rubber time. That you add to your you, know, you add to the total amount of your time that you spend. You start at 7, so you add whatever time. And then at the end of it, see your life is different. See your life is different. But it takes the continuity of worship to experience that. Last but not least, now this year, it says here, to him who overcomes, I will grant the seed with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And it is actually joined with Jesus himself. Jesus himself is singing through you. You're on his throne. You're united with him. And some part of Jesus is flowing through you. And when Jesus sings through us, looks at Hebrews chapter 2, there is a creative force that is released. Creative force that is released. In uh, Hebrews chapter 2, it says here, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 12, I will declare your name to my brethren. In the midst of the assembly, I will sing praise to you. This is a prophecy about Jesus singing through us. See, the word I is Jesus, the word your is Father God. So the context of verse 12, the I is Jesus. So Jesus, we are seated together with Him on the throne, joins with us so that the Master and the disciple become one. And it's Jesus worshipping through us. And if you notice... In verse 11, both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. And verse 10 before that says, he's bringing many sons to glory. And it tells me that when Jesus joins with us in this seven aspect, you begin to see the glory of the Lord that originally belonged to him. It vibrates through you. You ask me, why? Now, in John chapter 1, verse 14, it says, from verse 1, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then verse 14, the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we behold His glory as the glory of the only begotten of the Father. What happens when the Word became flesh in us? Colossians 
and the Lord told me, this worship is only meant for those who become the Word make flesh. It says, let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, this worship was not caused by the Spirit. It was caused by an abundance of the Word. When the Word becomes flesh, your DNA becomes musical. It's a singing DNA. So the question that I ask you this morning is, is your DNA singing? If your DNA is complaining, no wonder a lot of people, they complain, complain, complain. Even their mouth don't open to complain, their DNA is complaining. So that's why when their mouth open, also complaints come out. But if your DNA is in the Word and full of the Word, your DNA is a singing DNA. And that is why when germs and virus try to land on it, it's a different tune, cannot attach themselves to you. Do you realize what Jesus was like at the microscopic level? What microscopic level, right? Imagine if we put a microscope, an electron microscope on Jesus' hand, on Jesus' skin. Surely when Jesus walked about in Galilee, as he do all the normal things a human being do, surely germs and virus and bacteria are around, correct? You cannot say there were no bacteria around. But every time the bacteria or virus are around, when they come near Jesus, not even near the skin, there's a bubble about him. As they come near, every germ, virus and bacteria die. I mean, you think Jesus' life was amazing. But you should look at Jesus' life at a microscopic level. And when, when, wherever he walked, whenever germs and viruses, hey, they go near, all of them die. And they die and just cannot exist. That is Jesus at a microscopic level because He was the Word. He was the Word made flesh. Today, He wants to make the body of Christ the Word. That's why He's washing the bride with the Word. Washing the bride with water, which is the washing of water of the Word. He says, My Word has made you clean. When the Word has become flesh in us, your DNA is a singing DNA. So that if anything tries to sting you or bite you, maybe not now yet. Lah. Maybe if a bee tries to sting you today, it might succeed. But as time goes by, be a mosquito come near. No matter how your bubble is, it go. And say, ah! And the bee or the, or the, or the mosquito dies. That is because their frequency is different from yours now. So as your body is being transformed, its body is being changed, there is something singing even though you are not singing. Remember we talked about um, transgenerational uh, inheritance, epigenetic inheritance, where your body itself has a voice. When the word becomes flesh in you, your DNA actually singing vibrating along. And that's the level of worship that he wants. Now this is what Paul tapped on in Acts 16. In Acts 16, when they were singing him after him, him after him, him after him, and when they sing, they tap upon something. Because at that point, they had first love. I mean, you have to love God. They had just obeyed God. God told them, go to Macedonia. So they went to the capital of Macedonia, which is Philippi. And they did God's work. They preached the gospel there. And as they are there, in God's place, in God's fullness of time, doing what God wants them to do, as they preached, they got imprisoned, they were beaten and everything. But the word of them could not be imprisoned. They could still sing unto God. Which is why when Abraham, or I heard those things happen to Abraham, I said, the one thing, don't let the devil rob you of first love. Don't let the devil rob you of worship. And you choose to worship. 
you choose to praise Him, you choose to love Him, then you begin to see the power of God in your circumstances, in your physical body. Even right now, whatever symptoms you're experiencing, you choose to worship Him, you choose to praise Him, then you will know that God has that in, in your life, in your body, even right now. And no sickness can stand. And when God heals you, you remain cured. You remain full in your life. You remain absolutely wonderful. Yeah, that reminds me of your sister in Belgium. And uh, so when the Lord touched her, the Lord will continue to do a work in her life. And yesterday when we were on the journey, on the van, um, I saw a vision of your sister. And um, there was like... Um, um, there were like symptoms of a swelling here and there in her body, but let her know that maybe she's listening. Uh, uh, let her know that don't worry about that. Uh, that as she continue worshiping the Lord, that uh, all those things will go off. And uh, so don't worry about that. Just worship. Do today's message. Worship. Love the Lord. And she will feel all the organs and tissues going back to full function. And all the water retention, all those things will flow easily. And she will receive perfect health in her life. And um, uh, so, uh, the one of you ladies here that uh, 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 do you have a problem on your hip and your leg area? area? Yeah. Okay. The Lord want to touch you today, and uh, today you don't have to have those symptoms anymore. And also, there is a sister, uh, and you have a frequent uh, sort of headache that feel like something grab you on the head. And uh, the Lord says that uh, it's an oppression that came into your life when you were small. It's come and gone, come and gone, come and gone, and. Uh, Occasionally, it comes again, and, and the Lord says that as you worship Him, it will go away and never come again. So, let's enter the, this place of worship, that when Paul entered the, this place of worship, that they are able to, uh, God is able to touch, to heal, and you receive perfect help. Even those of you who are really healthy, you find you receive another level of strength. And also, uh, you all know, Ephesians 5.18 When you're filled with the Spirit, you speak in some sins and spiritual songs. And let me tell you, there's a difference. Both end up the same thing. You look at Colossians 3.16 Some sins, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart. Right? When you compare it to Ephesians chapter uh, 5, verse 18 and 19, it looks like the same thing. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. And it says here, Do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Look, the same thing. Speaking to one another, psalm, sing, spiritual song. Singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus, submitting to one another in the fear of God. Looks like the same results. Psalm, sing, spiritual songs. But the Lord says, actually, it's two different things. Remember, Jesus says they will worship me in spirit and in truth. One is actually in spirit, the other is in truth. One is in spirit, the other is in truth. And there are these two forces that must come into your life. In the Old Testament, they were able to worship God in the spirit. Because the Holy Spirit came on them. And then when the Holy Spirit came on them, they were singing, they were playing music. Now when the Holy Spirit is on you, you are able... To worship God. And it's like you playing the guitar, you playing the piano, you singing a song. It's like you are doing it, but not you, but the Spirit through you. Because the Spirit joins with your Spirit, and when the Spirit comes into your life, it is you and yet not you. It is the Spirit and not the Spirit, but you. So it's you and the Spirit become one. And you're joined together. You're joined together. And, uh, okay going to talk about that after. Uh, you're joined together in the Spirit. And uh, so, that is the part where you feel that that's you. But actually, the Spirit flowing. But the other part that's beyond feeling in your DNA is the Word make flesh. Is the Word make flesh. 
And that part is your subconscious. Because there are two parts of you that must worship God. Your consciousness and your subconscious. Your subconscious is where the Word of God is written in your heart and in your mind. Hebrews 8 and 10. So is the Word flowing through you and the Word energizing in you. And I will close with one life. One life. And He is Moses. Remember in the Old Testament, God says, nothing that is touched by man is allowed in the presence of God. But you look at Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. Because Moses broke, Moses broke uh, the tablet that God gave him. Moses broke the tablet that God gave him. And uh, when he did so, uh, just put and highlight on this area. When he did that, on the second time, on the second time, God told him to actually go and cut a piece of the tablet and bring it to him. That's in the book of Deuteronomy. And um, the scripture in, uh, okay, is here. In chapter 9. says in chapter 9, verse uh, 11, It came to pass at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, the Lord gave me two tablets of stone. And then we know he broke that one. He came down, and the two tablets were in his hand. And here is where, in verse 17, it says, He broke them. He broke the tablet. And God was upset. God was uh, angry at the people and Moses was uh, before the Lord. Then this is what the Lord said in chapter 10. Heal for yourself two tablets of stone like the first and come up to me on the mountain and make yourself an ark of wood. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablets which you broke and you shall put them in the ark. Do you know that the second tablet was made by Moses? God who said, I will not accept, I will not accept that which is done by human. He accepted Moses' work. And it's not easy work now. Moses has to actually cut out the two tablets. He really know what the size because he held it before. So now he has to use an instrument to cut it out. You know what the second tablet represents? Grace. The first tablet represents the law. The law was broken. The second tablet represents grace. Because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, you and I are no longer we and I, us. We have become the body of Christ. So when Moses was holding his hands with the instrument, and he has to be an instrument, but something like a chisel and a hammer. And he, as he's chiseling the piece of rock out, and after he chisel, he got to chisel it, look nicely. It was no longer the law. It was like his hands belonged to God. His strength belonged to God. And it was not Moses cutting it. It was like the grace of God allowing it to be cut. So, in the grace of God, He's accepting that we have become the flesh of His flesh, the bone of His bone. Ephesians chapter 5. So that your hands are no more your hands. Your body is no more your body. Long ago, there was, uh, in my ministry, there was this little boy who had a problem in sickness that was quite severe. Then in the midst of the preaching, I was talking about Jesus and how Jesus is in us. Then the little boy had one simple revelation. His simple revelation was this. If Jesus is in me, I belong to Jesus. And then my body is Jesus' body. Since, since Jesus' body cannot be sick, my body cannot be sick. So sickness cannot be on this body. And so sickness don't belong to me. I thank you, Jesus, that I'm your body now. And at that moment, he got his healing. 
when you see that your body is no more your body, your body is a temple of God. As long as you see your body as your body, it is your body. When you see your body as the flesh and blood of Jesus Christ, then the grace of God works in your body, your hands, your lips, your works that are born of the Spirit become the works of Jesus. And suddenly your works become acceptable to Him. And suddenly you are in the second wind of grace. It's no longer I who live, Paul says, but Christ who lives in me. And it's no longer we who live, but Christ who lives in us. Let's enter for a short time into this worship. Thank you. Let's enter into this time of worship. And the first place that you enter is in the Spirit. Let's all rise together.